This episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, Gables, Garadubs, and students all came in three packs, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? What's the difference between a gamekeeper and a gatekeeper? Between a Trigenis and a Trigalis? Between a Jack in Office and a Mr. Cocksure? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 240. I know that country, Holmes. Hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look into the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. Bert, do you know what country you happen to be in right now? I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a, a status check for you. I was out earlier looking for the Greenwich Meridian, and I couldn't find it, so I think this is North America. Oh, well, thank goodness we've narrowed that down. Um, <laughs> what country within North America? Well, you'll have to stay tuned for that. It's if, just a trifle. It is, it is. Well, if you would like to check out the show notes for this episode, they are available at iHose.co slash trifles240. It'll take you to our website where you can sign up for email updates. You can leave us comments there. Uh, you can look into some of the links. And, of course, you can find a link to support us via Patreon. Uh, we occasionally put out bonus content, and uh, only our Patreon supporters for as little as a dollar a month have access to that. So check it out, see what works for you, and we appreciate your support. Well, we mentioned North America and kind of not knowing uh, on which side of the demarcation lines we uh, sat. But the good news, Bert, is that we have an inspiration this time from north of the border, all the way from Canada. Our friend Chris Redman, who is a regular contributor on uh, the I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere website and has been a an interview subject there on IHOs a number of times. He wrote a book called A Quick Succession of Subjects, Lectures and Speeches on Sherlock Holmes. It was uh, published by uh, Gasogene Books and uh, the Wessex Press in 2016. And there was one particular essay in there called I Know That Country Holmes, Holy Geography, and the Sherlockian mind's eye. It was something that he uh, gave, a paper he gave at the Bimetallic Colloquium in Montreal in June of 2000. Of course, is a Canadian uh, gathering. And I, I was struck by this because I heard, I, I remember this phrase, I know that country, Holmes, from the Sussex Vampire. This is when uh, Holmes and Watson had received that letter from uh, Cheeseman's Lamberley. Uh, actually, well, it wasn't from Cheeseman. It was from uh, Morrison, Morrison, and Dodd, but it referenced oh, right. Cheeseman's Lamberley. And that, of course, was where uh, Big Bob Ferguson uh, resided. And uh, it's, he says, uh, Cheeseman's Lamberley. Where is Lamberley, Watson? Oh, it's in Sussex, south of Horsham. Ah, not very far, eh? And Cheeseman's? I know that country, Holmes. It's it's full of old houses which are named after the men who built them centuries ago. You get Oddleys and Harveys and Caratons. The folk are forgotten, but their names live on in their houses. And I just I've always been struck by that uh, that phrase. I know that country, Holmes. And we could go on and on and talk about the houses themselves. I think we'll save that for another episode. But I think right now, thinking about geography 
in the Sherlock Holmes stories and what geography means to us as individuals. Uh, we were kind of set off on this by uh, Chris Redmond's paper. Yes, indeed. And we should mention, although we're not going to get in, as you say, to just to, to diving into the houses of Sherlock Holmes. And there are some great names, Baskerville Hall, Abbey Grange. But our friend Ed Gerard also sent us a terrific email a couple of weeks ago suggesting this topic. And he is in Texas and has just named his residence Title Town Place. <laughs> <laughs> And, of course, we've got friends, you know, Tyke and Teddy Niver, who've lived in Baskerville Hall for years. And uh, it's a lovely topic. But we will at another time get into the just house naming in Sherlock Holmes. You know, when I was at uh, university, I lived in Warren Towers, uh, one of the largest dorms at Boston University. And uh, as I was beginning my... Uh, my correspondence with the Speckled Band, I, I renamed it Appledore Towers in honor of uh, <laughs> Charles Augustus Milverton's. So another one of those canonical houses. That's why none of your mail was ever delivered. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another one here for Dead Letter Monty. Yeah. But in Chris's paper, you know, which, which uh, is sort of a guidepost to this discussion, you know, one of the points he makes is there's a powerful human impulse to give names to places. Countries have names and cities and the small villages and even the tours on uninhabited Dartmoor. Mm. Well, in many parts of England, you know, individual fields have names. And, um, you know, that's what we see in a lot of Sherlock Holmes, because after all, Places are important to people, you know, whether they're good or bad or primarily beautiful or innovative, you know, and there are places that are purely entertaining, you know, like Disneyland and Disney World. Um, you know, most of the time, the places that matter to people are the places where something's happened mm. and where, you know, something important has gone on. Ba battles, you know, you can think in the in America of... Gettysburg, you can think in London of the courtyard of the Tower of London. So mm. you can think of Flanders Fields, obviously, in Europe. You can think of the Battle of Hastings. Um, you know, these places loom large. Yeah, I mean, even, uh, you know, when I go to New York and, uh, you know, I love architecture to begin with. Um, and I, I go down toward, um, oh gosh, uh, the uh, the Flatiron Building there on 23rd. Uh, mm. looking like a, the great bow of a ship as you look up at it. Um, you know, just exploring these things. And, and the, think about um, other triangular instances, the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in New York. Um, you know, the building is long gone, but it's a memory of something that happened there, something tragic, something that changed the face of uh, the city and of regulations really across the country when it comes to uh, fire. Uh, so, so places do have a lot of meaning to them. And when we ascribe a name to them, that helps that meaning uh, keep living on from generation to generation. And there's a lot in the cases of Sherlock Holmes that um, inspire people on these kinds of journeys to find the places. You know, for example, Lauriston Gardens, which is a name we encounter in the mm -hmm. very first published case of Sherlock Holmes, isn't really a place at all in London. It's in Edinburgh, <laughs> where Arthur Conan Doyle was born. And, you know, it can, if you look at it, you could say to yourself, well, clearly he had Edinburgh in mind. Mm. And then in the Sherlockian world, you know, we see a lot of, you know, you mentioned um, the plaques and the, and the notations and the house names and things. And of course, in Britain, they do a better job of this than in the States where there are lovely blue plaques in London about yeah. places, you know, that have historical significance, including places where Conan Doyle lived. But yeah. there's a statue of Sherlock Holmes in Baker Street, of course. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, there's statues of Sherlock Holmes in Myringen and uh, in uh, Edinburgh as well. So, you know, this, this becomes part of the collective uh, consciousness at that point. So why don't we turn our consciousness quickly to our sponsor and we'll be back to continue this journey in Sherlockian geography. The Baker Street Journal continues to be the leading Sherlockian publication since its founding in 1946 by Edgar W. Smith. In its pages, you'll find both serious scholarship and articles that play the game. The journal is essential reading for anyone interested in Sherlock Holmes, 
Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and a world where it's always 1895. If you subscribe to the Baker Street Journal, you'll get four quarterly issues as well as the Christmas Annual. You don't have to be a member of the BSI or of any Sherlockian society, for that matter, to subscribe to the journal. It's open to anyone who enjoys talking about, reading about, and writing about Sherlock Holmes. And you can also contribute to the BSJ. Your imagination is the only limitation there. So get on the bandwagon and subscribe to the Baker Street Journal this year. Make it an important part of your commitment to the world of Sherlock Holmes. Just go to BakerStreetIrregulars.com and subscribe today. You know, uh, as we talk about these uh, these pilgrimages uh, Sherlockians love to make, and I know David Hammer, as a Sherlockian author, made a number of voyages over to England, um, both in the city and the country, to identify some of these old locations. Um, I, and I know when I first got off the train uh, in London, I headed straight for uh, Baker Street to check things out over there. Um, but, of course, there are um, uh, publications that you can buy to guide you through. We, we um, had a copy sent to us of um, A Tourist Guide to the London of Sherlock Holmes by Charles O. Merriman. Oh, uh, yes. That was done for the, the Sherlock Holmes Journal, uh, Volume 10, Numbers 1 through 4, and Volume 11, Numbers 1 and 2. And I remember in that first journey to London I took, I actually got four little pamphlets from the Irregular Special Railway Company called uh, Sherlock Holmes London Walks. There were four of them. There was Paddington to Baker Street. Uh, there was Euston to Trafalgar Square, Trafalgar, Trafalgar Square to Euston, and the City of London. Right, so it was an opportunity to go and visit some of those hallowed places mentioned in the stories or, um, you know, perhaps not by name, right, like the Alpha Inn in uh, the the Blue Carbuncle, uh, that is the Museum Tavern, just across from the, the British Museum. Oh, that's so lovely. And, of course, there are some lovely companies that still run many London street tours. You know, you can go on a Jack the Ripper tour, but every t well, whenever I'm in London, you know, sometimes I still like to go back and take, again, the tour of of uh, Fleet Street and the mm. tour of the Inns of Court and, and oh. of course, some of the Sherlockian mystery tours. There's just a lot of fun. Yeah. Even even though, you know, you come across things like, of course, Tower Bridge, which um, goes across the Thames and connects Whitechapel to the old Kent Road. Mm. But uh, it wasn't even there, I don't think, when uh, Holmes, until well into Holmes's career. And, of course, London Bridge, the real London Bridge of Holmes's day, um, you know, is now somewhere I think in in Arizona. Yeah. But still, in all, you know, there's plenty of plenty of mystery and plenty of magic uh, looking around London in search of Sherlock Holmes. And Michael Harrison, among others, you know, wrote in addition to David, wrote a great book that people still refer to called "In the Footsteps of Sherlock Holmes." Yes. That's a lot of a lot of fun. That that is a classic, one that uh, the folks should seek out if they can. Um, and and if you're seeking things out, I know one of the first stops. Uh, for people when they go to or when they used to go to London on Baker Street looking for 221B um, before the Sherlock Holmes Museum got there. Number 221B was actually occupied by the Abbey National Building, which was uh, a bank and insurance uh, scheme. And they actually received regular letters addressed to Sherlock Holmes, had a secretary there for years who used to answer on behalf of Mr. Holmes. I have one of those letters because I was cheeky enough to, to write and ask for Mr. Holmes's autograph. Um, <laughs> and, and the secretary, I still remember, claimed that Mr. Holmes was not only busy keeping bees uh, in, in, uh, on the downs, but he had severe arthritis, and that made writing very <laughs> difficult. So... Um, <laughs> 
But you know, you, you go to uh, the Abbey National uh, Building. It's you know, and it's a big uh, commercial building. Doesn't feel authentically like Sherlock Holmes. But you move a little farther down, and and you're right there at the architecture that makes a lot of sense and and looks as if you stepped back into Victorian and Edwardian London. And you know what? That's good enough uh, for a lot of people, even though it's at 239 Baker Street. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I- I agree. You know, and if you took uh, a look at a map of London that also showed the reported crime rates for the 1890s, you know, you could learn a little bit if you stop it to think about uh, Holmes and the society in which he was lodged, you know, what his surroundings were all about, because his clients, you know, really were uncharacteristic in general of that of that surrounding society. But more to the point he engaged, Holmes engaged in that sort of kind of, you know, cartographic research once or twice himself, sending out to Stamford's, which was a, a perfectly real shop, for maps of Dartmoor on which he could plot his uh, available data. Mm. So this sort of exploration is very much embedded in the cases of Sherlock Holmes. And, you know, that that combination of the real and the fictional, this blending of the two that Doyle did so seamlessly, I think is what made the character come alive. Because even though uh, Baker Street, Upper Baker Street, as, as it was known in those days, did not exist as we know it today, um, Holmes, is, Holmes really isn't Holmes unless he is in Baker Street. You know, we can't extract him from... Uh, uh, from his natural environments without thinking of him uh, in the way that uh, Doyle originally intended. And it was done in such a way that, uh, again, that's that's why people wrote to uh, 221P Baker Street, because they actually thought he was a real person. Yeah, and that certainly has been amplified over the years, particularly in the Granada production. You know, with that really remarkable set of for Jeremy Brett, and his Watsons, uh, I thought it was so impeccable. It was the first time that I had seen the Baker Street sitting room as a airy and and light filled place. You know, typically in the up until then, it had been you know very dark maroon wallpaper right. portrayed in many of the films when they decided to portray it in the proper you know late nineteenth century period at all. But boy, that Granada set, you know, was very friendly and welcoming. Yeah. It certainly was. And, you know, um, it's just, it's all quite fundamental to um, the whole pursuit of Sherlock Holmes and for um, um, locating him in a place, you know. And, and it, it, th- this whole idea of identifying places as historic and locating individual history in them. Um, you know, it's really fundamental and something very human. You know, you can always come across people who, and when they're out on a walk, say, you know, I remember when I went to that restaurant. And I remember this lovely thing that happened to me here in the park. Yeah, and, and I think in so many of uh, our instances, because we encounter Sherlock Holmes first in our adolescence for most people, um, these are our first interactions with a lot of these geographical places, if we are not native uh, Londoners. So we, we have that, that individual experience of hearing about or reading about uh, these locations in London and thereabouts, and they become very meaningful to us. So, so when someone like me does make it to London and picks up my, uh, my Sherlock Holmes London Walks booklets, um, they, they, bring to 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 mind that first time i read the story or or an aha realization ah oh, i'm physically seeing what i had in my mind's eye for so for so long and it's a it's the evocation of a memory that doesn't really exist because we haven't been there and yet we have been there only in our minds yeah it's it's uh it's true. And, you know, it's it's an important thing that's been recognized in different ways. You know, for example, the BBC Sherlock with Benedict Cumberbatch would never have been as successful as it was if it hadn't been so squarely rooted in contemporary London to the degree that Stephen Moffat and Mark Gatiss 
made London a character mm. in the BBC Sherlock, exactly as London and England of the 19th century and early 20th century is a character in the cases of Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, that, that's a great point. To the, to the extent where uh, now fans of the show, rather than going to 221B Baker Street, head over to 187 North Gower Street to Speedy's uh, for the set location that was used for uh, Baker Street in the series. That's, that's remarkable. And it, it also reminds me of an episode we did with, um, with Burt Cools. I think it was episode 69 of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where he remarks that he wrote or realized that the Moor itself was a character in The Hound of the Baskervilles and needed to be treated as such in that kind of dramatization. Yeah, well, folks, the next time you are making a radio play and you want to take a part of geography, an area, a field, a region like Dartmoor, and make it a character in your script, good luck with that. Because believe me, <laughs> that is not a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You take my breath away, Mr. Holmes. This is not a convenient moment. <laughs>